All right, guys, this podcast is brought to you by Body Armor 2.0, the continuation of the next phase of Body Armor, my eight-week body weight only program. Now, if you're looking to get in shape, to improve performance, and to enhance your body composition, this is the program for you. If you've already done Body Armor, the next phase of this, the next step is to do Body Armor 2.0. So make sure you do it. And if you haven't done any of those, make sure you check out Body Armor and Body Armor 2.0 down. Link is in the description. Let's get started. Let's get after it. Now on to the podcast. So we are going live and we're doing the podcast today here, the Real Strong Podcast. So make sure if you haven't done so to go ahead and subscribe to the YouTube channel, the Real Strong Podcast. I have my guy, the one that did all the surgery to my knee. You can check out that video on my YouTube channel, Dr. David Abbasi, orthopedic surgeon. The man, he also does a lot with the MMA community. So make sure you check out his channel. What's your channel's name again? It's uh, David Abbasi, MD. MD. So check that out and check me out on Instagram. Instagram too. So again, we want to get some questions from you guys. We're doing the recording and we got the live for a little bit. So we're probably going to do this for about 15 minutes and then we'll go into our regular recording. So if you have questions, make sure you send them off for me or Dr. Abbasi. We can go ahead and go over them. So how's, how's things going, man? Things are going well. Yep. You know, busy. I was, uh, I was at Eagle FC this morning doing weigh-ins. Mm-hmm. So we're getting ready. That's Khabib's new uh, event. So yep. that'll be tomorrow night. So I'm excited to do that. Nice. Yeah. How, how is that different from the other ones that you've done? Because so you've done the UFC also. I've done the UFC. Mm-hmm. So UFC, you know, very, very organized. And I was re- actually really impressed with the Eagle FC. One of the most uh, organized, like weigh-ins at least, that, yeah. went, that went down. So yeah. you can tell they get, they, they, they're taking care of business. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they've been doing it for a long time. I think it was called something else. Uh, but Habib's been, a, been really? a part of that for a while. I thought that was kind of new, like, in the last uh-uh. year. No, they've, they've had... They changed the name in the last year, obviously, when he retired. So did he, so did he acquire it? I think so it was already <clears throat> going on, and then he yep. put his name on it. Yep. I see. Yep. Okay. It's, it was a Russian Smart. promotion. Okay. So I think that they, you know, obviously, he's a big name in Russia, so... That helped out. <laughs> I know I have Hector Lombard. Tyler Ray also fights for that promotion too right. as well. So, I mean, it, it, from what I hear, it's a good promotion. So I'm, I'm, I'm interested to see. I haven't gone to an actual event. Yeah. But, um, but I may go in July when Tyler fights. So okay. it'd be cool. And actually seeing, like, Junior's fighting on the card too as he's well. He's tomorrow. Yep, JDS. Yeah, he's tomorrow. And then who else is fighting on the card? Uh, we got Hector, obviously. Who else right. is who's big name fighting on there? Um... There was, there was another guy, Sanchez. He was a previous UFC guy. He's, he's, yeah. he's fighting. Diego? Um, Diego Sanchez? No, not Diego. Uh, no, but he's going to f- be fighting Kevin Lee, I think, soon. Uh, they have he does fought. fight Kevin they Lee. Not, yeah. That's a crazy one. Honestly, that is. I don't really like to see Diego <laughs> fight anymore. Um, I think, and that's a big problem. We could talk about that is like how you stay in the game, how athletes and fighters feel like they have to stay in the game to like prove to themselves and, and I guess prove to others that they still have it. Um, and they lack, in my opinion, that self-awareness to know, all right, this is the time where I need to move yeah. on and, and yeah. pivot and do other things. Right. And it, and it, and it kind of lingers on until, you know, ultimately they, they get six fights, six fight losing streaks and shit like that. So yeah. it's like, when is it time to, to call it quits? Yeah. Do, do you take, like, for you being a doctor, right. does it take you to step in and say something? Like, this isn't what you well, need to be doing? So I- yeah, I mean, there, there, was a, there was a guy today mm-hmm. that I was actually talking with. I was doing his pre-fight physical, and he was not that, he wasn't older yet, so he still has time, and he's still appropriate for him to fight. But I was asking him, like, I'm like, you doing anything else, like, or to make a living, or is this pretty much all fighting? He's like, right now it's all fighting. He's like, but he said, he's like, yeah, I do got to start thinking about my next, what I'm going to be doing next. I was, like, yeah. I was like, I think that's a great idea, and I think it's mm-hmm. smart to start thinking about that now mm-hmm. while you have time so and, and you can start doing it now so as you move on you that transition is already there you have another way to make income yeah what i always get worried about with the older with the older guys you know mm-hmm. 40s or approaching the 40s is are they fighting because of the competitive spirit or are they fighting because they need the money mm-hmm. 
and the, I get concerned about the ones that are fighting because they need the money, mm -hmm. and some of them should probably not be fighting because they've had you know a history of getting knocked out and yeah. bad finishes, and so mm -hmm. that that definitely is concerning. What's what's like a what's a warning sign that you see for those guys that actually do need to move on? Lo I'd say losing their chin. Okay. Um, okay. You know, they start the career, they were able to take a punch, and now it's like if, they, if they've been finished mm -hmm. or they're going down, you know, with relative ease yeah. lately, yeah. that's not a good sign for brain health. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I see that a lot, you know, and guys that used to have a chin, they no longer have it. Right. So now they're getting knocked out by jabs and like yeah. punches, that, punches and strikes that they've never gotten knocked out before with. And so that is the, is a sign that I would say is, yeah. and when, when, when do you step in? When do you do that? When do you be like, all right, man, listen, it's because of this. And I think if you had the opportunity to actually step in from a, from a more medical side, right? Because you have that ability to do so. Right. As a coach, it's very hard. Right. Because I can look after them in right. some, some capacity, yeah. especially being a preparation coach. Like if they're physically fit, and I've had this plenty of times yeah. where a lot of the older, ath yeah. older athletes are in great condition, but they just can't take a punch anymore. You know what I mean? Right. So I would say it's different, like if, if, if a, a fighter is my patient yep. and I have that rapport and we have, we, ha we can talk freely, then I can, you know, that might be an easier conversation. It becomes more difficult if you don't have that rapport, if, you, if, they're, if I'm not there necessarily, they're orthopedic surgeon or they're, they're a real team doctor or something, mm -hmm. I'm just doing the pre-fight physical. I mean, the pre-fight physical, yeah, they have to pass some neurologic signs and things. Um, we don't really require, you know, from the Florida Commission or most commissions, we don't require any like imaging yeah. of the brain. Uh, if a fighter is over 40 years old, we do require a brain MRI or a brain CT scan. But a, a lot of times, even if they have like concussions and stuff, the MRI or CT scan will show up negative. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so we might not have that inside knowledge how easy a guy or, you know, how early a guy's getting dropped. Yeah. So that might fall more on team members and things, but I know it's a it can be a sticky situation and you know, emotions are involved. Let's say a guy does get a concussion, what's, what's the procedures after that though? Like when they get knocked out, right. what do you do after that? So in terms of like, let's say like a suspension from a fight. So mm -hmm. TKO finish, the, you're, at least uh, I'll speak in terms of Florida. So a TKO mm -hmm. finish, we are required to give him a 30 day suspension, mm -hmm. which may not be that. From a, from a full knockout, it's a 60-day suspension. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, like, how much does that really do? Because how often are you really seeing guys f fight within 60 days? I mean, I guess you get the, um, the Kamzats who, you know, yeah. are sensational. Yeah. But, I mean, that's, that just means they can't have another competition in yeah. 30 days or 60 days. We, we don't have, you know, a spy on them to make sure that they're not training in the next 30 yeah. or 60 days. But we, that's, th those are the allotted recommended times mm -hmm. from that, a minimum standpoint. But really, if you have any symptoms whatsoever, yeah. you're really not supposed to be training. For sure, yeah. Because yeah. it's hard to recover. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, as a coach, that's where you do talk to the doctors and, and see exactly what they need to be doing. And then the coach has to make sure that they stay on point with what the doctor wishes. Yeah. And so it's really about pulling the athlete back, letting them recover fully so that this doesn't happen again. Right. And, and, it, and more so than less, it, it does happen again, which is a problem. Right. And I think that that's, that's not just in MMA or in combat sports, that's in football, that's in you know, any type of contact sport. Right. Um, man, I've gotten so many concussions when I was right. playing ball, and this so is when you say that, so reason. so tell, so explain to everybody. Uh, you you said you've had concussions. So yeah. explain to everybody what kind of symptoms did you experience when you? How did you know you had a concussion? You always have. So the the initial impact, you're like you don't know where you are, right? So that that can be like when I was playing football, uh, I would go in, tap, make a tackle, whatever. I get a concussion. I'd go on the sideline, and I would think I was still on the field. So like your memory, your, your, your perception of where you are in space is like nullified, right? So after that though, did the crowd noises, did the crowd noises bother you? I'll did the that. lights so, bother you? Yeah, so that's, that's another thing, right? You get nauseous, uh, irritation of light, um, really like dizzy at times, right? Vertigo type feeling. Um, yeah, and those are the main things. So when I, when I get rocked, let's say for instance, you know, you get sparring goes hard and, and you get rocked or you get hit and um, you get that concussion or you get concussion syndromes, you need to stop. You need to, and a lot of guys don't. They'll keep going because they have that killer mentality. They want to compete. Um, and really, you need to take some time off at, right. that, at that point. You cannot mess with your brain. If you, if you 
keep doing that particular stuff. It's not like your your knee or your or right. you know your arm or something like that. Which we can brain. fix the knee. You can fix it. You can fix the knee. You you have fixed it. Yeah. So yeah. So do we have any <laughs> questions going on? So while you're looking for questions, I'm struggling to heal from lateral elbow tendonitis. Any suggestions? <laughs> okay, lateral elbow tendonitis. So probably talking about tennis elbow. So that would be uh, lateral epicondylitis on the side. So I would say some some easier things that low hanging fruit that you can do. Try to look at your routine every day. Is there something that you're doing that is irritating it on the regular? So one common thing can be like if you're lifting small kids all the time or lifting heavy groceries or bags. So one easy fix that you can do is instead of lifting away from your body, try to start lifting closer to your body, engage more of your core. That's one easy fix. See if like, are you typing a lot? And then when you're in a certain position, does that irritate that area? Um, if, if, you, if you try to eliminate those, those inciting factors, it's still not getting better, then you can try to YouTube or Google like, you know, some tennis elbow exercises. And then if that's still not working, you can make your way over to see a guy like me or another orthopedic surgeon, and we can talk about does it make sense to do injections mm -hmm. of you know steroid or PRP type injections, mm -hmm. and ultimately if those things don't work in the end, then we can sometimes consider surgery, but that's the, the minimum of cases. I've had a lot of that issue with being underneath a bar and squatting, right? Because you're, you're basically contorting and trying to torque your body into that bar path. So as I get the bar on my back, I'm squeezing the bar as much as I can. So compression does definitely help with that. Um, if you have to do a movement, like you're, you're, you're doing a sport that requires you to get into that position like powerlifting, um, compression, and then also soft tissue work. So that could be anything from, you know, Graston. I also like dry needling. That does help a lot. It's helped a lot with my, with my neck and my knee. Um, and then just any type of, um, any type of myofascial release treatment, right? So that could be foam rolling it, that could be you know, getting with the massage therapist and actually getting in there and relieving the tension. Also increasing range of motion in the adjacent joint. So shoulder range of motion, rotation of the elbow too as well. A lot of the times you're, it could be your forearms are stiff, your bicep is stiff. So increasing range of motion and working and trying to eliminate that stiffness is definitely gonna help too as well. Uh, visionary underscore seven says, like that uh, name. Phil, how do you program box squats in your routine for powerlifting? Mm -hmm. But that's in the mentorship, right? Yeah, so we have we have a lot of that in the mentorship. I mean, for the most part, <laughs> box squats. That's my talk. Box squats <laughs> is uh, is something that I would do off season. I wouldn't I wouldn't use it in a prep phase for powerlifting, especially for raw lifters. So getting closer to real, you know, meat prep. I would take it with a box and then I would work on your, your competition squats. And you can also work in front squats too as well. But box squatting in general is good from an off season perspective just to get some rate of force. Also teach you how to actually sit back and use more hamstring and hip. Um, it really depends on if you, you know, you wrap or you do sleeves, you know, if you're raw or anything of that nature, right? So if you're in sleeves, however, you're gonna be, you know, having more anterior translation of the femurs. So you're actually gonna be doing more quad squatting in general in sleeves. So the box, if you wanna work it, I would work it as a supplemental lift after you do your competition squat, especially during prep. Now, if you are in wraps, you're gonna use more hips, more hamstrings. So this can be beneficial, especially for that. I would take the wraps off, do box squats, right? Work your way up into, you know, triples or fives and get more strength endurance that way and build up heavy efforts. And then once you get closer to meat prep, while you're in meat prep, I would say around eight to 12 weeks, then you want to take away the box and start working on your competition squats. Nice. Doc, uh, they want to know, Nearly Block would like to know, hello from Israel. Would you recommend Hi. stem cell injections for meniscus tears? Okay, so first we have to uh, back up and, and, and define what exactly is a stem cell. So I think a lot of people incorrectly label what is a stem cell. So like PRP, for example, is not really a stem cell. So a stem cell basically has to come from your, like your pelvis or your tibia, from your bone marrow, or it can come from your fat. So that, that would be something to use a stem cell for. Um, and, and, and we also have to talk about what exactly is going on with the meniscus. Is, is the meniscus causing you pain or is the meniscus causing, some, is there like a flap of meniscus that is structural. So if there's some, a structural problem, um, then a stem cell is not gonna change the structural problem. Um, if, it's, if it's just causing you pain, that could potentially relieve the pain, but it just depends on the, the nature of what, what's causing your problem and your symptoms. Right, definitely. Uh, Coach 
Coach Fitz says, I appreciate the response to the 10 and 9's question. Definitely started with pull-ups. Notice I pulled with more forearm strain. You the man, Phil. Mm. Yeah, and another thing, when you're doing, when you're doing those pull-ups, I actually have a video on how to actually properly do a pull-up. Because a lot of times guys will pull and they'll, and they'll take it and where the elbow is more like abducted, so or adducted, I should say, into the body. Where if you're looking to enhance upper back strength and your lats, um, I would go with more of a neutral grip, more so for the lats to keep the body in, in that range of motion, so good posture. And if you're trying to hit upper back, you want to flare the elbows out and get more of, of that extension, thoracic extension as you pull, so chest goes to the bar. So you're not putting that torque on the elbow. So change your hand grip for your lats, and then also if you're going to go ahead and use more of an upper back pull, then you go ahead and widen out your, your elbows here. Again, you would AB duck, so bring your elbows out and then pull up, get that thoracic extension. How far, how far down do you suggest going on a pull up? I like to get full range of motion. So you go all the way down like this? As much, listen, again, <laughs> it really depends on your active end range control. So okay. like if somebody lacks full yes. shoulder flexion, right. I wouldn't even I wouldn't even prescribe pull-ups to that that right. way. I would start off in more of an inverted right. position, maybe do some TRX right. pulls too. So I would add, so if you have shoulder instability or if your shoulder is ever dislocated, you had vein cart repair, which is basically labor repair, be really careful going all the way like this because you're in that 90-90 position where the ball, the ball can again come out of the socket. So mm -hmm. if you start feeling like you're unstable, just maybe stop a little bit before going all the way down. That's one mm -hmm. thing I would. Mm -hmm. yeah. So how to heal my supraspinatus injury, best exercises. Okay. So you can go with the supraspinatus, tell them what it is. Right, right. So supraspinatus is the most commonly torn rotator cuff on the top of the shoulder. Um, so when you say supraspinatus injury, we need to know, do you have a full thickness tear mm -hmm. of the rotator cuff or do you have just a strain or tendonitis? If you have a full thickness tear of the supraspinatus, those will not heal themselves. Um, so there's really no exercises that will heal that. For a full thickness tear in a healthy young, you know, young person that's active, we do recommend surgical repair, with, which can be done arthroscopically and then your mother-in-law, mm -hmm. right? She's doing great. Yeah. Um, if you just have a partial tear, depending on how, you know, how thick that, that partial tear is, that can sometimes be improved with you know, doing rotator cuff strengthening exercises, which you can Google or YouTube, and then you know, exercise bands in terms of working on that external mm -hmm. rotation internal rotation in and then and then flexion. You don't want to be going too heavy anytime you're exercising your rotator cuff. I usually recommend no no greater than five pounds. Otherwise you're gonna start hitting the bigger muscles like the deltoids. You can also do isometric holes, things like that. Yes. If, uh, you're coming back from injury. Right. Um, I think that was our major thing is like isometrics and getting into eccentrics yeah. and then going into isometrics full. first right isometrics first to mm -hmm. just get the muscle engaged and then you start doing active motion. You, you know what's so funny is that like when everybody has an injury that's the that's that's the you know, procedure, the progressions. But if somebody lacks coordination, if somebody lacks the ability to activate a muscle, that's what we do as well from a training perspective. Right. People don't really understand right. that. It's like if you can't move well, well, if the muscles aren't firing effectively right. and your joints aren't moving like true joints, right. then it's really pointless from a coordination standpoint because you're just not understanding how the right. body's supposed to move right. with those muscles that allow it to yeah. happen. Yeah. So we do these isometrics to help, you know, to help with activation and movement and everything right, else. Right. Yeah, that's cool. All right, so let's go with, what's the worst shoulder injury that you've ever seen? Worst shoulder injury that I've ever seen. So, you know, so me, you know, there's a, a range that you can answer that with because, you know, on the traumatic side, there's certainly, you know, severe uh, shoulder fractures or clavicle fractures, proximal humerus fractures, even glenoid fractures. Mm -hmm. um, so that's from a trauma standpoint. Now, what I do, I do mostly sport, arthros you know, arthroscopic surgery in mm -hmm. sports medicine and athletes. So in my population of younger athletes, usually we're talking about, you know, shoulder popping out of the socket or a shoulder dislocation, mm -hmm. then we, you know, have to do things like labor repair. So I have had cases where I've had to repair the entire 360 degrees of a labrum. And the labrum is basically, when you, you know, the shoulder's a ball and socket. So the labrum, um, usually that socket is shallow in the shoulder, which allows us to have such great range of motion mm -hmm. as opposed to the hip, which is another ball and socket joint. Where <clears throat> you don't have as much range of motion because it's a deeper socket. Yeah. So that's good in the shoulder, but the downside is you're more likely to dislocate. So we have these cartilaginous uh, bumpers called labrum that help to deepen the socket. And when you dislocate out, you tear that labrum. So mm -hmm. on the really severe shoulder dislocations, you can actually tear 
the entire 360 degrees of labrum. So I've had to put in like nine anchors Dang. or something like that to like repair the labrum back and restabilize the shoulder. Um, those are fun operations. I bet they are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so after surgery, like we talked about, what it, like shoulder surgery in particular, what are some good exercises that you think would be beneficial for somebody coming off of that okay. type of So injury? I would say after surgery, in, t in terms of just general principles, like where we're talking shoulder or knee or elbow or whatever, mm -hmm. first, you always want to regain range of motion. Yep. So range of motion always comes first, and you really ideally want to have painless range of, full range of motion. So once you've acquired that and the doctor's giving you release that you can, you're, you're set to go, mm -hmm. then we start engaging more muscle activation and strengthening. Which I did not follow your rules on that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Phil basically went in immediately to like pull like a 800 pound sled with your knee after ACL. So that's not, that's not how you're supposed to do it. But, um, and, and then I would say like we were talking before, isometric would come first just to get the muscle firing, mm -hmm. or you can even do things like stim, but you wanna actively try to do it, yeah. and, then, and then slowly you know, working on act, full active range of motion. Yeah, I mean, so the, the real, I guess, journey towards getting me back to like, I'm like 99%, like honestly, yeah. when, with the knee. Obviously yeah. now I have the, the, the neck injury now and that's just how it is when you're going as hard as possible and you're competitive. You're trying to destroy your whole body. Basically. That's how it goes yeah. in, in this yeah. world. Yeah. If you're trying to be extraordinary, uh -huh. this is what happens, right? right? And you see that you know, with the guys that you've worked with too as well. You've worked with a lot of elite fighters. You know, but for me, it's like, how fast can I get back to full go without, I guess, having to worry about messing myself up even more. So I would say it is important, especially like if you're, if you're watching this and you're a pro athlete, um, um, you know, everybody, you know, what, so I'm an orthopedic surgeon, what, what I hear a lot is like, well, I heal faster than most people, <laughs> okay? I, my body heals faster than everyone, okay? So you can't rush the biology. So it doesn't matter, and, and you might do surgery and you might feel great, and that's what we want, that's ideal, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you can go faster than, than the schedule that the, the surgeon puts you on because that biology, whatever's happening with your surgery, it, it just takes time. And so although you might be pain free, if, if, that, if that tissue is not fully healed, you are risking you know, re-tearing it or, or complicating things by, not, by going too fast. So always listen to the surgeon because sometimes the quickest way to get to where you wanna do is resting in the beginning. Mm -hmm. But all the other stuff will come once you get a nice solid repair that's healed, then we can really kind of accelerate the rehab. But if you don't get that f foundational part first, then, then you might be starting to chase your tail a little bit. We've, had, we've seen three now tib-fib fractures, right? It was tib-fib right. and then maybe like- Yeah, tib-fib. Basically. Are you talking about like Connor, yep. Weidman, and Silver. Anderson Silva? And Silver. Yeah, yeah, So yeah. those three, right? <laughs> all in the same way in some capacity, right? What's going on with that? Why are they, why, why, why is this going on? Is that from stress? Is that from not being able to recover from weight cuts? Is that from wear and tear for you know, years of training and fighting? Yeah. Or is it all of it? Well, I'll tell you, like when I've, when I've done surgeries on, on fighters, I will say they have some of the thickest bone. I mean, like yeah. elephant, like even your, like your bone. Yeah. It's like elephant bone, I mean, yeah. it's like, thick bone, mm -hmm. hard to like put screws in and stuff because like it's just the bone is so solid. I mean, so if you review the, if you review those injuries, I think a lot of them were, they were, were they doing the kicking and they got checked? I mean, or, no, Connors was kind of a mystery, yeah, right? Yeah, a mystery, he, yeah. he, he, I think it was he, like, fractured before or something like well, that. Well, he talked about like, Mike, he talked about he like had a stress fracture. fracture, but and then he showed images of his ankle, which would have yeah. been completely unrelated. Okay. So I don't, I think that one's a little bit of a mystery. Chris Weidman, um, I believe he got checked, mm -hmm. which broke it, and then he took a step back, Yeah, Ugh. which was the same as Anderson, I want to say. It was, exactly the same, same way. Anderson against so Weidman, and then Weidman against Uriah Hall. So basically, Uriah Hall's got to watch his back. Yeah. Right? Like, <laughs> yeah. Basically, passing yeah, the bad juice. Definitely gonna... But I think they both got checked, and then they, they came back. And, and if you look at, like, Weidman is, Weidman's a little bit older now. Mm -hmm. Anderson was certainly a little bit older mm -hmm. when that happened. So. Maybe age has something to do with it. Um, but again, I mean, most of those fighters have extremely solid bone. I think it was just kind of, 
it would be interesting to know if they had any symptoms or of a, like a stress fracture bef- leading into that. But it might have just been this perfect storm and just kind of like. I think that's yeah. what you do is you chalk it up to all three or four or five issues, you know? Yeah. Because when you're fighting and you're training nonstop, your body's under a, a huge amount of stress. So, like, bone density can go down in that particular way. Like, right. stress in general just messes you right. up all the way around. Right. Um, micro fractures in training, right? Constantly kicking the bag, right? Even though, you know, yeah, that, that can help with calcium deposits and help build up the bone, right. but who, who knows, right? At that point, I think it's more important overall is that we have to strengthen up the muscles that surround it. We need to increase calcium by doing right. resistance training, you know? And that's why, that's why my bone density was so, like we get bone density scans done before camp, yeah. you know? And a lot of my guys, most of them have a, a large amount of a good yeah. bone, you right. know what I mean? And they're, they're strong, they're yeah. stiff. But, um, but I think over time, yeah. again, like you said, yeah. it's that constant trauma that, right. that kills it. So, I, and I would say also to anybody that's watching that you might not be a pro athlete, but um, if you feel like you're just like not healing like you used to, or you, you feel like you you're just have these nagging injuries that you can't get over the hump. So when patients come to me in the office and we have the, or if we're following a stress reaction that's just not getting better, I always ask them like, How, what's your diet like? If you're not getting the right amount of calcium, if you're not getting the right amount of vitamin D, you're not getting those building blocks to try to help that bone repair. So. The other thing that people don't know is like sometimes just taking a multivitamin is not enough. So you don't even get the allotted amount in yeah. one multivitamin. Right there, you're not getting enough vitamin D. You're not getting maybe enough calcium. So maybe you take two of them um, or you just get specific vitamin D and calcium. But you got to put the right stuff in so that you have the right building blocks to try to heal and repair the body. Hydration is key too. Right. A lot of water. Yeah. Um, and, that's, and that's another thing that I thought about just as you were talking was the lack of hydration basically could be from, you know, the weight cut the day before too as well. So the weight cut also could have a, play a major yeah, role in that yeah, as well. Right, but I mean like, if you want to find something wrong on a fighter, you just get an MRI, mm-hmm. right? Because you, I mean, you, you guys, they all have something going on. Everyone, nobody is perfect going yeah, into a Yeah, I found out that so. I had three herniated discs. Yeah. And I probably had it for a decade, <laughs> like, you know what yeah. I mean? So it was yeah. probably there and now because of the issue with, you know, the, the nerves, I was like, all right, now I got to figure it out. Right. But that most likely was from playing football since I was seven. And probably you started some type of injury, and yeah. then it might continue, to, you know, with your lifting and your lifestyle, yeah. more wear and tear, and then all of a sudden you're to a point where now you're feeling symptoms. Yep, exactly, yeah. exactly. It's all cumulative, so unfortunately, with, with the body, if you're not repairing that stuff, and mm-hmm. the discs are hard to repair. Definitely, yeah. definitely. So what, so give you guys some context, if you don't know, I have three herniated discs, C5 through <clears throat> C7, um, bulging in different areas. So I think C5, I looked at that image, yeah, because right? you guys dropped it off the office. Yeah. So, and I think should we? I mean, should I talk about yeah, it? Let's do it. Let's do it. I I think I remembered like mostly herniation, which basically means you know, so you have vertebra, which are the bones, and you have these discs or gelatinous, which should be kind of squishy. But if it, that disc can sometimes pop and then you lose that height between the bones and then you can start basically pinching on nerves. So mm-hmm. it looked like you had the herniations going towards the left. Mm-hmm. So I asked Maureen, I was like, does he have any numbness tingling going down the left side? Mm-hmm. Maybe the tricep area mm-hmm. or um, yep. C6, yes. yeah, C7 or like one of these C- two fingers. Well, we got yeah. C5. Yeah. So that was like radius, <laughs> that was like radius and index, mm-hmm. right? And then C7 was my tricep. So it kind of makes sense, right? Because yeah. it does run down. Right. So I had tricep, like almost tricep tendon pain. Yeah. And uh, that was real bad. And then my shoulder and my, and I, and I felt it like Terry's, like Terry's minor, Terry's yeah. major. It kind of ran all the way through. And then this was just numb and tingling. It yeah. still does like every once in a while, yeah. but doing the traction has definitely helped. The neck traction. And then you got injections. Yeah. The injections so. definitely, the, the injections <clears throat> help more so than anything. But I think keep you know with with the the physical therapy you know with the trashing making sure I'm not doing anything dumb like messing it up even yeah. more I'm being very careful with my training uh, being very methodical doing more bodybuilding type stuff uh, where I can really focus on like just isolation is is helped but with that do you what do you what do you see is like time of recovery I mean. 
hopefully the injections have a good, you know, have a good response. Mm -hmm. um, but neck, neck, and just neck and back in general can be just brutal. It's like, like I tell other people, it's like it's different than the knee and, and stuff in terms of it's just really important real estate. You have your spinal cord right there. Yeah. You have the spinal nerves right there. Mm -hmm. And so it, it unfortunately, it's, it, it kind of can differ for everybody. Yeah. And I have some stenosis that yeah. I heard. And can you explain to them what, what that is exactly? So, you know, stenosis you can get either with, within the central canal where the spinal cord is, or you can get stenosis around the exiting nerves that come out of the spinal cord that supply into the peripheral nerve. That's so where I have it. Basically, you, it's basically every nerve should have a nice big hole that it can make, kind of travel through. And stenosis is basically when you start collapsing the space around the nerve, and now that nerve starts to get pinched, and then you start feeling this numbness, the tingling. Mm -hmm. Depending on which nerve gets uh, gets stenosed, mm -hmm. you're, you'll feel the, the distribution of that nerve going down the arm, depending on which number, ner so, cervical nerve that is. So that's where the stenosis is, is in, uh, at the opening, so the, it is right. pinching on the nerve. The one thing that we don't want is that herniation or stenosis to go into the spinal cord itself? Because mm -hmm. then I could get weakness and atrophy after that. Right. So, you know, what we're doing yeah. is to combat that is to get that constant tractioning. And then let me ask you this, and I haven't asked you this ever. Should I actually think about getting it cleared up though over time? The getting stenosis. Does it, I mean, will it get cleared up? Are you asking? No, I'm saying, should I go in and surgically? Oh, I mean, surgically. Yeah. I would say, I would treat you based on your symptoms, yeah. not necessarily what the MRI shows. So mm -hmm. if you start having, you know, really bad numbness, tingling, or you start showing um, what we call it atrophy, mm -hmm. sometimes you start, if the nerve gets pinched for so long, you know, your, your muscles that it supplies will actually start to atrophy. Yeah. If you start having those, I don't think you, I'm not seeing any atrophy yet. Not so yet. If, you, if you start, <laughs> so if you start where you're getting atrophy or you just uncontrollable numbness, tingling, despite injections, then I would say, I mean, you, you, will, you will let them know, like, I can't handle it anymore, I need something done. No, it's definitely subsided. Like, I wanna say I, you know, at least 65% better, you know, which is really good because I, there was a point where I couldn't even pull back my neck, like my head or anything like yeah. that. So, yeah, now it's fine. It was severely painful, yeah. almost like somebody was stretching me from behind and like pulling every muscle apart when I pulled back my chin. That doesn't sound comfortable. It was terrible. Yeah. It was terrible, but yeah. it feels a lot better. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, hopefully, you know, we'll, yeah. we'll see what happens. Um, so, but I, I would always base the decision to do something surgically depending on your symptoms. So you can't just do everything based on an MRI all the time because when we see patients in the office, you might have one patient has a, just a horrible, like painful looking MRI and they don't, they don't relatively have that much pain mm -hmm. versus someone that has a more kind of minimal, you know, damage type MRI, but they're in excruciating pain. So you have to make everything make sense. Here's something yeah. that I want to let them know, because I know the answer to this one, but it's just something that I get all the time and it'd be better answered by you. Is I that, hope so. It well, let's be. see. Yeah. Let's see if I can answer it. Yeah. You, well, it's, it's just basic, <laughs> basic stuff. But okay. If, like, what are the major things let's say injury-wise, that you would want to see an MRI on and what aren't? Because some people just get MRIs okay. for anything, right? Okay, um, so I would say if, you, if, you're, if you're training or something, let's say like your knee has a pop and then you start having like swelling of a, if you have a pop of a joint and you have like swelling of a joint, excruciating pain, that would be a reason to get an MRI, mm -hmm. okay? Because that means something probably structurally happened um, so there was like, in a, usually if, it's, if you had an event in time, like I, I remember I took my step back, I came down from a, a dribble or something and my knee actually popped, it got swollen, that tells me probably you tore your ACL or meniscus. Mm -hmm. Something structurally happened, that is deserving of an MRI. Uh, versus something that's a little bit more chronic or you can't really put your finger on when it happened, that might be more attritional or more like wear and tear that might not need an MRI from the start with, mm -hmm. you know, a good exam might be able to, you know, tell you what, you probably have like a tennis elbow mm -hmm. or something like that, right? There wasn't like an event in time, I just started hurting and popped. Sure. No, it's like my, I got pain on the outside of the elbow, mm -hmm. you know. So not like acute, yeah. something yeah. acute would be Yeah, more if, so if, if there's something like sudden that. dramatic, yeah. like I was bench pressing and my chest just popped and my muscle pulled in, okay, yeah. you probably tore your pack 
Yeah, or yeah, my I was doing you know, I was doing uh, bicep curls. I was doing bicep curls and my elbow just popped. So yeah. when you hear, you have a pop that's painful and you start getting bruising around it or swelling, that's definitely a reason to get For an MRI. Sure, yeah. And see an orthopedic surgeon mm -hmm. right away because if if we want to have a good chance of repairing it, you, you gotta kinda do it sooner rather than later. I would say the least thing that you have to get an MRI on is the rib cage. The rib cage, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, it's, getting a chest x-ray, I mean, usually it's gonna be a um, costochondral, you know, sprain of the, of where the cartilage meets, meets the rib. All MMA fighters always have rib issues going on. I pop my ribs uh, yeah, several pop your times. rib several times. Those actually, believe it or not, I have taken care of a lot of rib stuff in mm -hmm. my practice on MMA guys. They do great with injections. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, what, what Cortisone or PRP. Gotcha. So I had gotcha. one guy in the UFC, just fought on the last card, was dealing with rib issues for five years. Mm -hmm. He's got cortisone, got cortisone. He's like in England, mm -hmm. but he comes and trains here. And then uh, his buddy's like, oh, you gotta see Dr. Bossy, help my rib. We PRP'd his rib. Mm -hmm. He said he's literally dealing with it, struggling with it for five years. Yeah. He, I, I saw him a month, like months later, he's like, he's like I, it still has not, I don't feel nothing. He's like, he's like, it was a miracle. Mm -hmm. He's nice. like, I thought I was gonna feel this for the rest of my life. And that's cool. That's the, yeah. the greatest testimony. I mean, it makes you feel good, you know. Yeah. And every every patient that we do things on is, is kind of like another research. Mm -hmm. You know, you get more, you for get sure more data. Get you get yeah, more data. Absolutely. So like, it doesn't matter what you read in the studies. Like, I want to see it work. Experience you know? it plays a big right. role in it, man. And, you know, you can learn and read the books and read the studies, but right. experience and right. seeing things is, is right. like. You can't beat that, you right? Know? So, right. It's awesome. All right, man. So, thank you All again. Right. Anytime. We're gonna do this one more time. You know, maybe a couple more times. It's my man here, so we'll have him on. If you guys All like right. it, you guys like the last one, so brought him on. We also did the live, so you can check that out. Instagram, my Instagram at the Roo Strong. Make sure you check out VivoBarefoot.com. Vivo Barefoot, that's the minimalistic shoe that I've been rocking on all my videos. Definitely helps with full foot functionality and athleticism, but also I'm coming out maybe, possibly, with my own shoe. But I'm not going to say anything about that anymore. Just stay tuned. Dr. Bossy, tell them where they can find you. All right, follow me on uh, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube, uh, David Abbasi, MD, or Dr. David Abbasi. Um, you can watch me take care of some of your guys' favorite UFC uh Athletes or guys like John Anik, Vitor Belfort, even Lamar, guys like Lamar Jackson in the, in the NFL. So make sure you guys check, check that out and learn something. All right, guys. Peace.